Hello, everybody, and welcome back to day three of the summer series for 2021. Today, we have two amazing workshops again. We're going to be starting with advanced scouting methods with Code Orange, Team 3476. And at 5.50 p.m., we'll have a mentor stacked panel uh, on shop essentials from starting your shop to expanding. Without further ado, Mahir, take it away. Hi, everyone, and good evening. My name is Mihir Joshi, and I'm the scouting lead on Code Orange. Uh, today, I'll be talking about Code Orange's scouting team. So uh, let's get started. So um, I'll start off by going over a brief overview of the topics I'll be covering today. I'll be talking about the scouting methods that Code Orange uses and a few tips we have, how we create our pick list, a little bit on our scouting site and what data we collect, and how we use APIs on our team. If you have any questions for me, go ahead and leave them in the chat. And I'll answer them at the end of the presentation. So before talking about scouting methods, teams need to be able to collect accurate and reliable data from their scouters. Um, in our experience, happy and entertained scouts collect the best data. However, many times scouting is not seen as being as important to the drive team or pit crew. Many scouters find scouting as busy work and monotonous. It's important that scouters feel valued and respected. Scouting used as punishment often results in unhappy scouts and unreliable data. Be sure to incorporate all the scouters' ideas and comments during the scouting meeting. Individual scouts often have more insight on specific teams as they've scouted the team's actions and left comments. Scouts also need to be, need to be well rested, so teams should create shifts to ensure each scouter receives periodic breaks. Giving them prizes or rewards also serves to increase their motivation. Code Orange usually gives scouters uh, snacks during their matches and hosts team-wide betting competitions to increase enthusiasm and interest. This can help the rest of your team get familiar with teams at the competitions as well. So, so now that scouts are motivated, how should teams organize their scouters during matches to collect the best data? Each team should organize their scouters in different ways depending on the size of their team and what information teams think are necessary to collect. If your team is looking to get more detailed information on alliances match strategies and rankings, you can assign one lead scout to each alliance. If you're looking to ensure data accuracy, your team can have two scouts on each team to ensure valid data from a match. Code Orange assigns one student per ro robot who collects information on robot actions. The head scout then watches the entire match, creates high level strategy and ranks the team's driving capability. Uh, the amount and type of data that, that teams collect is also important. Collecting too much data can be a negative as well. Collecting data on all robot actions would tire out scouters faster. Tired or unentertained scouts tend to collect incorrect data. Collecting unnecessary data can drag scouters' focus away from aspects that are more important. Having a scouter collect a lot of data in a short time also means that they have less time to record individual data points and have to take their eyes away from the game for longer. In our experience, collecting a robot's timing is difficult for scouters to collect accurately and robot positions often aren't used by teams for scouting. When collecting quantitative data, make sure to pick a few simple metrics that scouters can easily see from the, on the, from the bleachers. Incorrect data can be worse than having none at all. The incorrect data that scouters collect could result in changed pick list ranking, which would hurt the team during alliance selection and the playoffs. You should limit the data collection to values that you will be using during, uh, to make decisions and are not available on the blue alliance. For example, it's unnecessary to collect the total number of game pieces that each robot collects, as it's not important to make decisions. However, you would like to know if a robot stops working because that can help make a decision on its performance during the playoff matches. Code Orange collects data during, during events using pre-scouting, pit scouting, mass scouting, and through the uh, head or lead scout. So pre-scouting is most useful during champs as most teams have already played, so it's easy to find data on them. Um, so Code Orange pre-scouts uh, pre by choosing a few matches from a pre-selected group of teams to gauge the competition in our division. We collect data like their max game pieces scored in auto and teleop, their end game performance, their auto path, and what game pieces they can intake. Leaving comments during pre-scouting is the most important thing as they can tell more information that, about than the data that was collected. Uh, we collect mass strategy comments, their defense and counter defense comments, auto comments, and give an analysis of their driving. There is no, there, this, um, just as a reminder, pre-scouting is in no way a replication of what would happen. It is not a replacement for scouting, 
scouting the subdivision, as multitudes of factors can change between regionals and champs. Uh, during the first day of the event, we pit scout each team. To, um, pit scouting is usually useful to find if each team is ready uh, for uh, playoffs, to determine mass strategy, and take a picture of their robot. To find if each team is ready to compete, usually asking them about their robot weight and the amount of batteries and charges they have shows that they're more prepared for a limbs and probably have more replacement parts available. Um, determining, it also helps to determine mass strategy. You can ask them about their climber, their buddy climbing, and their auto runs. This helps you coordinate with their uh, with the teams during mass for mass strategy and uh, can help you score the most number of points during auto and during the end game. Taking a picture of their robot also helps scouters recognize the team and attach a robot to a number. Looking at the image of a robot can also help to determine some of the robot's capabilities that might have been missed during the mass strategy or pit scouting. It's unnecessary to ask much beyond these points as you'll most likely be able to see the teams using their subsystems during the matches. During match scouting, you should focus on individual team scores. Um, the Alliance game pieces scored can be found in the Blue Alliance as well as um, other information about their climate. Um, what, however, the Blue Alliance doesn't have information about what individual teams score or, um, or um, like individual facts and stuff about teams. You should also collect average drive rank as that can help with picking a robot with an experienced drive team. The offensive and defensive ranking can also help narrow down a list of teams that you're looking for when looking for counter defensive, defensive and offensive robots. Comments can always provide a deeper picture of a match. Uh, quantitative data often doesn't give us a full idea of the match strategy. You should also consider having separate defensive comment section where scouters can write about what each team did and what and which teams able to defend against well. This can help when playing match strategy as well. Head scouts and lead scouts look at overall match strategy and see which teams are best at defense, counter defense, and offense. The lead scout should analyze what went well or badly poorly during matches and adjust your team's match strategy based on what he or she shot the other teams do. So using the data that you collected during qualification matches, you should be able to find an ideal way for teams to work together efficiently by comparing their auto pathing, shot locations, climbing, and shot percentage. You should determine which autos to run and where your team should be able to shoot from in order to get the best chance of winning the match. You should also use this information to coordinate your cycles in order to have the most efficient scoring. Um, this data can also help you look at um, what strategies your opponents will most likely be using your like a match in order to have this can help you counter, uh, coordinate a counter defense and defensive strategy to hinder their movements and scoring capability. You can use uh, scouting to find out where your robot is inconsistent as well. This can help fix any problems or change your robot strategy. If you find that your robot is inconsistent from a certain area, you can swap cycle positions with your alliance partner to utilize both robots capabilities. You should have a scouting meeting the night before Alliance selections. You'll be able to have the most data and time available for you to make those decisions. Before making a pick list, you should identify what type of uh, team you want to play with. This includes whether you want a high or low shooter, a consistent climb, a consistent auto, any other spe specific capabilities, or a well-rounded robot. All of this depends on your robot's strengths and weaknesses and how an Alliance partner would complement them. After that, you should be able to start creating a pick list while going down the team rankings on the Blue Alliance. You should rank the teams in order based on the criteria that your team determined earlier in the meeting. When discussing the rankings, ensure that all scouts are included and all their perspectives are considered. At the end of the scouting meeting, create a list of teams that you still need more information on and talk to them at the next day of the competition. This information could include asking them about any inconsistencies or broken subsystems that your team may have noticed during the matches. So um, your pick list should consider, consist of the majority of the teams that are at an event, or at least the number of teams that we're playing in the playoff matches. This can be either 24 or 32 teams, depending on how many teams there are on each alliance. You should also be certain to write down some strengths and weaknesses about each team on the pick list so that Head Scout can refer back to it during the alliance selection process. When ranking teams on certain criteria, we found that it helps to create a weighted ranking. To create this ranking, give each, uh, give each category a number of points based on what your team has determined is the most important, with the most important characteristic having the most weight. The ranking will then assign a final point value to each team that can help your team create a pick list. Your team can create a short 
uh, do not pick list, but you shouldn't go overboard with it. The do not pick list should have robots that are inconsistent or don't complement your robot. Uh, be sure to talk to other teams that you may decline before alliance selection begins. Also, don't be afraid to change your pick list ranking up to alliance selection based on new data. If you believe a team should be ranked higher, confirm that with the rest of your scouting team and then move it. So now we'll transition into the scouting system. The scouting system needs to make it easy for scouters to record their data. The more steps that a scouter needs to, uh, needs to take to input data or the more data that need, they need to input, the higher the chances that the scouter could make an error. The data that is collected also needs to be readily accessible and easy to find and verify post-match. The data analysis that is done in your scouting system needs to, be, needs to be easy for everyone to understand. Creating graphs, trend lines, or maps of the field help people visualize the data that was recorded. The graphs and trend lines can also help to show whether a robot is improving or getting worse at certain tasks over time. Creating a sortable ranking table can also help your team sort the teams by specific categories. Including a team or match strategy page that has all information that you can use during strategy meetings can help your team as well. Different scouting uh, systems work well for different teams. The most common systems we've noticed include pen and paper scouting reports, Google Forms, phone apps, and websites. Each form has its pros and its cons. So let's start with a paper and pen scouting system. Pen and paper scouting system is easy to use and it's simple to set up. It also doesn't require technology, so scouters won't need devices in order to scout at events. However, since all data that is collected needs to be input into a spreadsheet manually, it can take large amounts of time and cause human errors in recording this data. It can also be hard to interpret from spreadsheets. This would also prevent teams from collecting large amounts of data. Scouters will then need to ma manually generate reports on their data. And uh, one con is that the scouting reports can be lost and can be hard to keep track of and store for future reference. Google Forms are the best way to have an online scouting system. Google Forms are also easy for scouters to use. The data will be stored and for future reference and can be analyzed to create a pick list. There's also no programming experience required to create a form system. However, it is hard to interpret data from uh, Google Forms or through the Google Sheets output. It also has limited data input, so scouters won't be able to put input information like auto pathing where the robots shoot and where the robots shoot from. Since it takes time to interpret data, it's hard to immediately communicate data with the drive team before matches. Every scouter will also need a device to use the Google Form. On phone or tablet apps, the data is easily interpreted and shown in a user-friendly way. It also happens immediately, so the drive team can have access to the data and create strategies in the match. <coughs> Sorry. Um, however, to maintain an app would require technical experience in, in developing the app. The phone app would also need to set up in a local server in the stands. Since there are many different devices, the app would need to be created for both the Google Play Store and the Apple App Store. The apps are only limited to mobile devices, so computers can't run them either. And finally, a website has all the pros that a phone application has, and it can run across all platforms. However, websites will also need technical experiences in language like HTML, PHP, JavaScript, and more to create the system. No matter which system a team chooses to use or switch to, it's most important that whichever scouting system is chosen is efficient, organized, and easy to maintain over the coming years. If a system requires technical experience is chosen, future students need to be taught in how to create the site in the future so they can take over. You should also be able to continue to change your scouting site and adapt it to, in order to incorporate more useful information. For example, Code Orange determined that collecting information on the inner goal in 2020 would be difficult as the view of the inner goal was often blocked. This would lead to unreliable data collected in the inner goal. So we decided to rely on component OPRs instead, which I'll explain shortly. So you don't have to manually collect all, all the match data. The Blue Alliance lets it use its API to read from the data that it collects. This can lead to your team automatically collecting some basic data about each team from each match. For example, in the 2020 game, the Blue Alliance reports data on the total upper and inner goal scored, each robot's climb, if the switch was level and whether robots left the line during auto. <coughs> Sorry, I've included a link to the Blue Alliance's API documentation uh, below and, um, and it should be in the chat as well. Using the Blue Alliance's API can be a great way to calculate different values. Our 2020 scouting site uses the total match score to calculate OPR and validate data with our own scouting data. 
Since the data the Blue Alliance has is a summative of the entire alliance, scouting is still necessary to collect data on individual robots. To validate our data, we gathered the total upper goal, total lower goal, total control panel from each alliance and each robot's individual climb. After calling the API and finding out the actual data, we need to check if our data aligns with the Blue Alliance. We would then need to go back through the matches to manually fix any discrepancies. Since it's often time consuming, correcting errors is only efficient if there's a significant discrepancy. <coughs> um, here's a short segment of code that your team can use if you want to implement a simple data validation function into your scouting site. I'll give you a few seconds to take a screenshot if you want to save it. Uh, you'll need to use your own Blue Alliance API key. You can also obtain a key from your TBA account page. Um, the code above uses the curl command that stores its output into a JSON file that is then decoded. So. So um, on this slide, I've included the OPRs, the top 15 team from the Jerusalem offseason competition that we can that we can be found on the Blue Alliance. Um, calculation of OPRs is solely based on the match scores and using rudimentary linear linear algebra. Um, to um, calculate OPRs, you basically have to set each um, team as a variable, and that their match score is a sum is a um, is a calculation is the um, sum of all those scores. Um, in order to get the OPR, you need to solve a system of equation, a large system of equations, to get that value. Um, OPRs work very well for linear scoring games, and um, where the amount of game pieces corresponds with the number of points. This means that it's really good in 2019, 13, and 15 but it doesn't work as well in 2018, 2017, or 2014. If you want to incorporate OPRs into your scouting site or scouting system, you can either calculate yourself using match data or use an API to take it from the Blue Alliance. I've put the link for getting the OPRs from a specific event on the slide, but it can also be found in the Blue Alliance under API documentation. So when looking at the Jerusalem offseason uh, OPRs, this, you can see that this gives an overview of what could happen, but not a complete picture of the event. From the OPRs above, we can tell that 33, 39, 1690, and 2096 make large contributions to your teams point-wise. However, we know little about what they can do and where their contribution comes from. <coughs> um, we can use the same OPR calculation process for other components, like different game pieces and where they're scored. Um, component OPRs are very useful for match strategy and getting a deeper picture of what happened at events. In the 2020 and 2021 games, we can calculate the total number of inner goals and upper goals scored. This gives a large scoring breakdown to see where, find out where teams perform the best. This helps to find out which teams target specific goals and how consistent they can score. We can calculate the inner goal OPRs on our website using Python in the back end. The information above tells us that 33, 39, 16, 90 score an almost equal amount in the upper goal at, 20, at 22, game, 22 power cells. This is almost two times as much as the other teams at the event. The inner goal OPR then shows us that 1690 makes a large number of inner goals a match. And then teams can then use the uh, COPRs to determine additional information. Um, we can, so in 2020, we can use this information to calculate the inner goal shot percentage as I showed, as I showed above. Though it's important to remember that since these um, were calculated from COPRs, their margin of errors increased slightly. Um, data above shows that 1690 makes their shots in the inner goal more, more than half of their shots, while other teams make it upwards around 30% or less. So we can take a look at the, uh, the finals match one from uh, Jerusalem offseason competition. Um, so while we, take a, while we take a look at this video, um, Take a look at the types of cycles that 1690 and 3339 make and where each team shoots from. So during the autonomous period, 1690 and 3339, the two robots uh, over here, are, um, are coordinating their cycles so that they don't have to interfere with each other during the auto. And at the beginning of the match, 3339 make, is making cycles with um, their driver station and uh, sorry, their um, loading station and back to their um, to their power reactor port. 6090 is also doing the doing the same thing, but from uh, using alternative cycles so they don't interfere with each other during the match.
And now, once uh, once both of those teams are in, able to score enough into their into the opponent's reactor ports, um, sixteen ninety now changes up its cycle and it moves towards um, collecting power cells from their opponent's um, loading station instead. And since their cycles don't in, uh, interfere with each other, they score a large number. Uh, they score. They both can score like around 22 uh, power cells per match. Um, 1690 was also incredibly consistent at scoring from right in front of the reactor port, as that's where they cycled to majority of the time. Uh, this allowed them to make a high percentage of their shots in the inner port. Uh, meanwhile, 3339 and other robots shoot from uh, much farther away from the reactor port, um, so their shots aren't, aren't like completely targeted into the inner port, but they can still score a large amount into the upper goal. Being able to score in the inner goal and in any upper goal and score large amounts have allowed them to get their, get the highest score because they were able to score the most number of power cells possible. Sorry about that. So um, do you guys have any questions for me from the chat? Yes, so we have a couple. Our first question is, how does your team relay information um, during competitions? So essentially, how does scouting information get from the stand scouts to the ones making the match strategy uh, and the drive team? So what Code Orange does is it has a um, match strategy page where all data that is um, collected by the uh, scouters in the stands is then analyzed and formatted in a way that's easiest for the drive team to um, coordinate their um, mass strategy from. So since we have a website and a, and a server, um, everything is updated live. So our um, drive coach and our drive team can take a look at that data and make their decisions from that. OK, great. So our next question is, how many students do you typically have doing scouting overall at each regional? So like including shifts and all that. So. Uh, we take we take around we need set around seven scouts at a time at, as we have the six scouts that are um, scouting each team and one head scout we usually have around 15 scouts so we're able to cycle each um, group of scouts once um, since the head scouts there basically the entire time um, those 15 scouts can help like do full cycle replacements as well as um, have individual breaks for a few scouts who who might need like bathroom breaks and stuff like that so um Next question I see in the chat are what's up, what's up, what are some methods that you can use to keep younger scouters engaged and motivated during the competition? So what, what we found to like engage younger scouters is usually talking about um, like first getting people, getting scouters interested in uh, scouting. Uh, what we do is we talk about mostly talk about data analysis and like show like a few, di few different matches and how um, like how which teams that they would pick and what actually happened and comparing that I've, I've seen that uh, younger scouters are pretty interested in, in that type of thing. Um, and a, lo a lot of the problem with scouting is that they they aren't really motivated during competition. That's usually, that usually comes from um, having to sit, sit there in one place for a long, long period of time. And the best way we counter that is to like cycle out scouters every five, five to 10 matches and um, give scouters snacks and try keeping them entertained. Uh, we have started using a, like a betting system where um, which is team wide, where each team, where each student goes around, and does a draft for teams, and like uh, whichever team has a, whichever student has the highest um, overall score at the end would win, and that helps keep team uh, keep student more motivated as they like have to be more involved in order to compete in those types of competitions. Uh, so, are there any other questions in the chat? 
Okay, so our question is, what are the differences between OPR, DPR, CCWM, and ELO, and which do you find most useful for identifying good teams during competition? So you can go ahead and unmute and we'll see if there's no echo anymore. So um, I think I think CCWM CCWM is pretty cool, uh, pretty cool in like finding out um, whether like defensive robots are good at preventing um, robots from scoring points. Um, I honestly, I personally don't like relying on just OPR or like any of those calculations because it doesn't usually tell the full picture. Um, if I will be using anything, I, I prefer like component OPRs and OPRs as like that can help with um, how teams how teams score, like where they score. Um, the most like at events, the best like data I like is um, qualitative data from scouts because um, collecting that quantitative data doesn't tell us the entire picture, and like qualitative uh, qualitative data does, as it tells like where the robots went, where they broke down, stuff like that. And to be completely honest, I prefer that type of data over most other calculations. Okay, I think we've done all the questions at this point. So, Mahir, do you have any last um, recommendations for anyone looking to, or anyone becoming a head scout, or any scouters looking to improve the accuracy of their data? Just anything you'd like to share uh, with our last five minutes here. And thank you, everyone, for coping with our audio issues earlier. We hope we've cleared up. Yeah, so... I think like any, anyone like looking to go into scouting, I just have to say it's like, it's a really, really fun. It's really, it's really, really fun. Um, like I know like collecting the data, it can be a little bit boring sometimes and I'm like, trying to encourage people, encourage scouters to like get through that, like getting to the more like strategy parts of it is what, is what I like to do. Um, I think like the big, the biggest part of scouting and where, where everything goes down is like collecting data gets really, really boring and like being able to fix that and being able to like, keep scouts entertained during that and getting them to that strategy part and where the, where the fun begins is, um, well, that's like the best part of scouting. So for anyone getting interested in that, like it might, it might be boring at first, but trust me, it gets, it gets really, really fun at the end. So um, yeah, that's all I have. Thank you guys. Shop Essentials panel. So we'll be covering everything from a team's first thousand or $10,000 all the way on to your next great expansion. And we have a wonderful slate of mentors and students today to share their um, different approaches to this. Um, so why don't we go and do a quick introduction to everyone. So let's start with Tyson today. Hi, I'm a mentor for Team 3309. Um, I also had a lot of experience with uh, 968 starting from 2011. Okay, let's go on to Rick. I'm Rick. I'm the lead mentor for the Robot Dolphins 5199, and I've been mentoring there since 2016. Micah? I'm a junior at Power High School, and I'm the mechanical lead for Team Spider 1622. Eli? Uh, hi, I'm an alumni mentor for uh, the Super Nerds, and I uh, graduated in 2020. I've been mentoring since off season of 2020. <laughs> Let's go to Ryan next. Uh, Ryan's joining us telephonically um, for the time being, but he should be uh, back with a webcam later on today. I definitely will. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, yeah, I'm Ryan Griggs. I'm with uh, 2485, the warlord out of San Diego. And I've uh, been mentoring our team and actually created our team back in 2008. Great. And then lastly, Sykron. Hi, uh, my name is Saikaran Ramadan. I uh, was a student on 696 from 2011 to 2014, and I've been mentoring Code Orange out of Irvine since 2015. Uh, thanks, Kyle. Okay, so now that we've got everybody introduced, I'm just the moderator, so I don't need an introduction today. Um, we're going to start with our first question. Um, and participants, if you can go ahead and use the raise hand function on the meeting, just so we know who's in the queue for answering questions, we're going to go ahead and do it that way today. Uh, if that's an option. And then if you are unable to use the feature, if you're like in, on the phone right now, um, then you can just go ahead and tag on at the end if there's anything to add. Yeah, you can raise your hand physically as well, that's fine. So, okay, so our first question is, 
what makes an FRC machine shop different from other machine shops? Who'd like to begin? I'm happy to try and take a shot of that if you'd like. Yeah, let's go ahead with that. Go ahead, Ryan. All right. I would say that the uh, one of the key things to remember about your machine shop as you set up your machine shop is that you are engaged in first. And that means, uh, from my perspective at least, that you are looking to engage young people uh, in learning about STEM, in learning about technology, and getting their hands dirty with that technology. Um, and one of the things I think that is important there is that as you set up your machine shop, you need to realize that you need to make it a place that's inclusive of even very novice members. Um, and so as you start to lay out how you're going to work, um, it's important to be um, willing to have stuff break um, and also uh, um, a strong sense of learning is one of the most important things inside of your machine shop. Um, at a professional level, I imagine a lot of the machine shops, it's still about you know, getting the stuff done. And for your team, it will be too. But that I think is one of the unique things about FIRST as well, is that this in many cases will be the learning experience that brings people uh, into the shop, um, gets them going in the shop. And you need to think about how do you energize your people to be in that space? Um, I'm sure a lot of other folks have a lot of good things to say. So I'm going to be quiet. Okay, great. Does anyone have anything to add on top of Ryan's statement? That was a great opener here. Rick, go ahead. I unmute myself. Okay. Um, I've probably taken 30 shops, I counted, between junior high, which I'm older than you guys, through college. So the main thing about FRC shops, it's a little, there used to be metal, wood shops, print shops, plastic shops, all kinds of stuff. Think about FRC. It incorporates it all into one shop, um, along with the uh, you know digital tools of 3D printers and CNC um, integrating that into CAD. So there's a lot of stuff to pack um, into one shop, and we'll get into talking about some of the equipment uh, later on. Okay, I think that covers our first question. So let's move on to our next one. This one's more geared towards rookies, but it can be applied to pretty much anyone who's looking at starting either a home shop or an FRC shop. Um, so for a startup team, what are the bare shop tool necessities for a $500 bus a budget or a little more? Uh, and what advice do you have for setting up a shop for a new team? Rick, you can go ahead and start again. Yeah, I'll, I'll take this one only because I think we're the, by number, we're the newest team. So I can remember how we started. Um, this close as 2017 we basically i went there to mentor and there was nothing really there so if you have a very minimal budget i'd say your first things you need of course are a, a, dr a small drill press it's probably like 50 dollars um important thing i went they were uh, other mentors were cutting uh, aluminum tubing with a circular saw on the ground which is really dangerous and scary uh, to me but you need a horizontal bandsaw which you can buy at harbor freight pretty cheap and you can use that as a vertical bandsaw and also, you'll probably be doing a lot of, uh, of pop riveting. Um, so you can go work with a hand pop riveter, but it'd be uh, behoove you to get a cheap pancake compressor, which is about $35 and maybe a, a pneumatic pop rivet gun. Um, and then probably a, a couple cordless drills. That would probably get you started. Um, other things to mention, not necessarily if you're buying the shop, but if you have mentors coming in, as a mentor, a lot of us brought our own like hand cordless tools in to start the shop off on. And the other thing we did, um, even with that minimal tool set, I was able to talk to like a water jet cutter uh, vendor. If you can hook up with them, then they can really do a lot of advanced parts off your CAD files before you have budget to buy your own tools to make those type of parts. Okay, great. Uh, let's move on to Eli. And then I think I saw Cycron do a little hand wave as well. Yeah, so Rick said most tools, I would say, but just when it comes to smaller tools, uh, definitely buy a nice set of Allen wrenches. A lot of the times having a color-coded set can be nice just because for someone who's not a mechanical or someone who is brand new, you say, hand me the red one. That can be a <laughs> very visual thing, but again, it is good to memorize the sizes as well. And the other uh, tool I would say we use more than anything is our set of ratcheting box wrenches and our set of sockets as well. So it's a really good idea to have a good wide range of you know, hand tools like that, 
just because uh, there's a lot of little small nooks and crannies on the robot that you can't get to unless you <laughs> have a socket sometimes and sometimes it's a box wrench. So you got to make sure you have a good uh, selection of wrenches. Um, to piggyback off of, you know, kind of both what uh, Eli uh, and Rick said, uh, Spectrum, uh, they're a team from Texas. They have a really great list uh, online for everyone to see called the Spectrum uh, First $1,000. And it's like their recommended list of what, you know, every team should get with their first $1,000. Uh, and it has, you know, you know, things from like step drills to, you know, like uh, Allen wrench set and, you know, um, all, all that kind of stuff. But I think some of my favorite things on that list that people just forget about, right, or make sure that you have a good uh, vacuum cleaner right with like a whole hose because that's the thing that like you're going to use the most in the shop right you're going to be drilling holes all the time and you're going to make a mess right and you don't want to you know make sure that gets you know, in your electronics uh you know make sure you have a nice towel to cover everything up uh and then there's you know dollies and clamps right there's a lot of like tangential stuff that people just kind of forget about that's also super important to have uh that you should you know try to get right off the bat perfect and we've thrown the uh, spectrum first five or first a thousand dollar uh, one in the chat as well. seems like we have a lot of Cycron support in the chat too. <laughs> um, Tyson, did you want to continue? Yeah, I just, I just want to throw in a 3D printer. I mean, that's, that's, that's legitimately a manufacturing tool nowadays. And it's at the price point that we can get them at, you know, at, at the, you know, non-Prusa stuff, it's like the hundred dollar range, $150 range. And it's, it's usually, uh, a, it's a big game changer in my opinion, uh, from the last 10 years, what I've seen. Okay, great. Um, so let's move on to the next question. It seems like we had a lot of great responses for this first one. So everything from leveraging potential sponsors for helping with manufacturing capabilities and working on borrowed tools and borrowed time. Uh, that is just what it takes to start a first team sometimes. Okay, so for our next question, it's going to move on to pretty much more of the next big expansion. And the question aptly is, what tools should you get for your next big expansion? And specifically looking at more higher end equipment. Who'd like to start? I, I can start. Um, I've, I've got an opinion on this that I think, I, I know I know where some of the other discussions are gonna go when depending on, on the price, but the lathe has gotta be the biggest, uh, the, uh, so after the drill press, I think a lathe is really important. Uh, there's so many axles that you're going to be working on. You got to cut the length and um, clean them off and maybe even uh, uh, undersize the hex or whatever. Um, and so uh, a little machine shop, high torque, uh, that one is probably as, as, as much as you need to get started. Um, the Harbor Freight Mini is okay, um, but I want to stress that you, you got to get a good DRO kit. Um, not a bad one or include your own. Um, cause you can only, you know, you, you learn how to use a caliper for sure, but, uh, uh, DRO is really going to step it up. Great. Micah, did you want to add on to that? Yeah, for me, I think that a mill is a really good next purchase, um, because you're able to go off of your CAD files and you can really precisely drill holes that you need to put your robot together. Perfect. Any, anyone else on these? Uh, Rick, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Eli. He'll go next. Okay. Um, like shops like ours, unfortunately, we don't have a bridge board or a mill. We can't fit one through the door. Um, we're going to probably get into this later, but like uh, Tyson said, there are new developments where it used to cost fifteen grand to get into a CNC router. You can get a get them now, like from a Chinese one for like twenty seven hundred dollars. And we'll talk about that more later. But that's probably our most uh, used tool. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. A, a, a CNC router on the Super Nerds, we in particular have a VLOX, which it's really nice because it has a, a giant around four foot by four foot bed. So, you know, we can cut in about three cuts. We'll have the whole robot done. So it's nice to just have a CNC because it cuts out so much manual fabrication and pretty much all the parts we make are so much to size where you don't have to do any adjustments. So Definitely a time saver, and it's great for prototyping too, because you can cut stuff like wood and Lexan as well. Uh, just when you get like a CNC router, make sure you don't buy it from a dead company. Uh, we also have a VLOX right now, and it's uh, we can't get support on that thing anymore. Yeah. So, yeah, I think the Omni is a good choice for teams right now. Yeah, if you're gonna get that Omeo. 
uh, just get make sure you get the USB version. Don't get the EPL. Um, it, it's just got a hor- it, you're just stuck with that UI and that little display. Uh, you want to get the USB so you can get put your computer on it, um, run Mach three. Uh, then it's a really useful thing. I, I had a really frustrating time with the um, the EPL box all in one kit. The USB one to get. I know for those listening, you might not have caught what we're talking about. There's that a router that Tyson and I are talking about. It's an Omeo router, a common one in FRC. It's the X8. It's very inexpensive. Um, we cut hundreds of parts on it. Um, like I said, we used to use a water jet vendor, that a friend that I knew, and they turned the stuff around in a day or two, which is really quick for a vendor. But we turned that stuff around that night with the Omeo and we when we have more budget we'll probably get another one because that's our bottleneck that thing's running all the time when we're there and uh if we go into that a little more you can set side budget for the the router of course the tools aren't that much but you need a decent air compressor that can run constantly um but otherwise it's a you know it's a pretty simple solution okay great any last words on this question or should we move on to the next one Okay, then we'll move ahead. Um, So what tool do you wish you had earlier in your shop, if we haven't already talked about it with the Omeo and 3D printers, but uh, this could also be what is your most underrated or your favorite tool in the shop right now? I'll go really quickly. It's not really underrated. This is like like the only thing everyone talks about on Chief Delphi and Discord, but the Mark Forge is really great. It's a really good printer. You can just kind of like set it and leave it. You don't have to deal with it. And obviously like the Onyx is a really good filament, but like we just print a lot of stuff out of Mark Forge. Although like PLA prints are good enough for most FRC use cases. We've like print most of our pulleys out of PLA and we've done wheels and like a ton of other things out of PLA. So any print printer is really good. Who has one? Yeah, we just call it Mark Forge in it. <laughs> yeah. The filament is very expensive. So we have a rule that we do not print and test prototypes parts with it. We either print an ABS or we print PLA first. And then once that's final design, then we print it in the, the Mark Forge. But it's it's a fantastic the parts come out are really very high precision and uh, just super strong. What's the price point on a Mark Forge? I think it went up to five now, five thousand dollars. So it is extravagant, but we just printed a big gear rack on our hood the other day. So you do gears with it; it's strong. Related okay. to that uh, oh. underrated uh, tools question, I, I will say that I think something that uh, maybe I don't know a lot of teams seem, seems to overlook. I think is um, uh, a nice, deep, handy burring tool. Uh, can be really nice to <laughs> uh, keep everything smooth. And it's one of those things I think you don't think about necessarily. Um, I also will say that a, a Dremel tool has actually saved our butts on more than one occasion, just being able to like get in there and like gouge out something, chop off something, shorten a screw or something like that. Um, so that's it's one of those tools where it just kind of pops up here and there. Um, and uh, when it does, you're really happy for it. And when you don't have it and you want it, you're like, darn it. <laughs> Okay, yes. thank you for waiting patiently, Eli. It's your oh. time to shine. <laughs> yeah, so to answer that question, um, one of the tools that I, other than our CNC machine that saved us the most time, uh, we have an electric Milwaukee um, riveter, and uh, that thing, it's only $240, although that's pretty expensive for a hand tool. <laughs> the amount of uh, use we got out of that every year is tremendous, and it saves so much time because every rivet you're saving, like, 15 to 30 seconds and that will definitely add up and I would even recommend buying two if you can. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's definitely the one. I heard they need to be maintained. We limit the use of it. We that's, I mean, that, that's more of our extravagant tool. It's so nice. I think they're like 300 bucks, right? With the battery. But we use the pneumatic riveter, but yeah, we love that Milwaukee uh, pop of it. But I've heard it needs maintenance or once it jams up, you have to throw the head away or something. So. Um, we're kind of scared to overuse it. That's a good warning because I love that too. Because yeah, I I hate rivets. I've, I've said it before. I hate rivets, but um, that made me start to like them again. That that one tool. Uh, but like I wanted a, to I wanted to comment on 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 the burr tool. I, I I agree that I have a I've got a really favorite um, deburring tool. It's called a Roto Drive from Noga, and it's not the standard deburr tool is just uh you just go ro- rotary around and uh it cleans up the edge of a, a hole you go too much it'll chamfer it um but uh 
but yeah, it's, it's, it's fantastic. Once you feel it in your hand, uh, it gets those holes really good. Micah, do you have anything to add from the student's perspective on a favorite tool in the shop? Um, not really. Um, yeah, debugging tools are really useful, but I, I actually haven't used rivets yet because I joined 2020 season. So wasn't much rivets to add because we already had a robot. But I would imagine that electric rivet gun would be a huge time saver. Yes, I can echo the, um, the I guess, well, both uh, fun to useness and the efficiency of the uh, electric or the pneumatic river. So yeah, those, that's definitely a great tool that teams should continue to get, or consider getting if they have the funds and availability. But on to our next um, question, which is kind of in line with our past one, but going for more of a little different approach. Um, what is the most unconventional tools you use in your shop, whether it's like a chemical, a uh, favorite chemical that you like to use, um, or just something that maybe not other teams really have, but you find a use for it some way. Go for it, Ryan. So, uh, I mean, I don't know if it's unconventional, but like, I'll, I'll say that like, we definitely have a few chemicals we really like to use. So if it's along this chemical lines, um, five minute epoxy, um, has definitely saved our bacon in more than one situation. Um, and, uh, so we like to have that on hand. Um, of course you, you want to have some lubricants, um, whether it's your lithium grease or just some WD-40 for a couple of different uh, reasons. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, super glue is always nice to have in your back pocket, uh, when you need it. Um, and, uh, you know, those are just a few of the sort of the, the chemicals. I, I will say that the, um, the, the five minute epoxy is, is pretty nice. It's uh, that's definitely a thing that we've, we've thrown into a mix of, of a variety of fast fixes, especially more in the competition, uh, area than, uh, you know, we're, we just like, we need it now for in five minutes. <laughs> so, yeah. Great. Going down the list, we'll go Eli Cycron Rick. Yeah, so this isn't an unconventional tool. I bet most people have used them, but for an FRC shop, um, is a, a big bolt cutter. So a lot of the time, you'll spend a lot of time grinding things like bolts that get stuck. Whereas with just one snip of a, a bolt <laughs> bolt cutter, you can get right in there. So got to say that saved us so many <laughs> so many times and so much, uh, you know, <laughs> elbow grease to get bolts and stuff out. So that's definitely a good tool. Um, to go kind of back to the chemical stuff, uh, turtle wax is something that we use like on things that uh, on the robot on like, you know, uh, parts that like interact with game pieces sometimes, right? So like 2015, you know, like coat your, you know, ramp in uh, turtle wax or if you have like a, a big giant object that needs to like interact with your robot, right? Coat it with uh, turtle wax so it remains slick and, you know, you can recoat it a couple of times if you need to, but it, you know, make sure that things don't stick to your robot. Go for it, Rick. Um, yeah, bouncing off a of cyclone reminds me, we use silicone spray, but turtle wax sounds better. Um, the one thing I think you guys all know, but didn't mention is Loctite. So anything that's not on a nylock bolt, we, we all find that other bolts on the field, right? Screws in the field, use Loctite. Um, use Loctite blue, um, it, it, when possible, it releases. You can use red. I like to use red at work, but um, with all the Allen heads, it doesn't work with red because the red overpowers the Allen head and you strip out the, the, the smaller bolts. Um, one main thing, and I saw this with a couple other teams I go around, I could see it, you can visually see it. Don't put Loctite anywhere near polycarbonate, especially a round hole. You get the, all these hairline cracks. I talked to other mentor, I said, you know, don't use Loctite. And they go, we didn't, it was over torqued. And, yeah, and someone goes, oh, I put Loctite on that. It, it does it every time. Um, so yeah, definitely learn by you know, trial and error. Um, the one tool I was going to mention, I don't know if you guys have it, but I got someone donating. We're getting a part tumbler. So with the, with the uh, CNC part, I don't know if you guys have one, but um, we're anxious to try that out. Kyle doesn't even know that yet. So um, it's kind of a larger one. We're going to see how that goes. Tyson, yep. And then Cycron has a follow-up, it sounds like. So we'll have Tyson, then Cycron. Yeah, this is getting a little bit beyond the essential, but uh, I, having a well, an in-shop welder uh, was pretty much a game changer 
coming from 968 to 3309 that where I can just toss it to a student and say, hey, put these two together and just make a right angle bracket out of two machine parts was um, and not having to wait. Because usually uh, we we had a, a sponsor that would weld it, um, but we, you know, that, that would be you had to design it and wait, wait for just to put it all together. But just to be able to do it right on the spot was was pretty amazing. Um, yeah, but that's that's on the uh, you know on the ten thousand dollar you know shop list uh, and a lot more price here and you got to have the room for it for sure. Um, just really quickly going before we move on, but Rick made me uh, think about it. But uh, on the other end of Loctite, right, on things that like are super important, sometimes we you know buy like a ninety nine cent bottle of orange nail polish, and we coat that on the uh, screw itself, right? So we can vis visually see when like a screw is starting to back out. You know, the nail pol polish starts to crack and that's just some like a, like it's really cheap and a good visual way of making sure that everything on your robot is super tight and it's, you know, very useful. Great. So that was a lot of um, kind of tips and tricks there. So not always the essentials, but still something to consider as you are showing your shop. I think we learned a lot of good things there. Um, number six, are there any tools in your shop that you regret purchasing? or that you would maybe purchase further down the line if you had known that they wouldn't be used as much at, at your current state of your shop. Tyson, you can start. Yeah, um, so speaking of DROs, what I mentioned earlier, uh, the little machine shop rotary DRO uh, that goes on their lathe is absolutely trash. Don't waste time with it. Um, I would have rather stuck a, use the super glue to put a, a caliper on, a, on the lathe than use that DRO, that was really frustrating. Um, but also, uh, not to bag on a little machine shop that 3990 mil, um, you know, uh, I, uh, I heard it earlier to get a mill for sure. Absolutely. A mill is great. Um, but don't get the 3990, uh, mini mill. Um, the, re and the, the difference is the, the Gibbs, the Gibbs, the set screw Gibbs just don't give you the precision. It's, um, it's really frustrating to use on a, as at a manual level. Um, I did CNC it once, uh, I did convert one it to CNC. It actually made it a lot easier to work with, but, um, at the end, that's not, I mean, I, I wouldn't recommend that for anyone put it up to do with that. It was the only way to make it useful. Um, yeah. So I, if you want to step it up, then, then you can get the, the Grizzly Geo 705 or six, uh, or, or anything else that has a tapered Gibbs. That's what you're really looking for. Okay. We'll go Rick then Ryan. Just bouncing off what Tyson said. Um, made me think about it. We do have the Harbor Freight mini lathe. Um, I don't recommend it. So I, I guess that goes under this topic. I, I'd rather get the one Tyson said. Um, he says DRO. I don't know if everyone knows what that is. Uh, digital readout to put on there. And also just going back to welding. Um, welding aluminum, you do need a special, you can do it with MIG on a spool gun, but I think both of you, I think uh, Cyclone's team, Tyson's team, you guys have TIG welders, right? It takes some training to do that. The MIG, we do have a MIG yeah. that we use for some stuff, but uh, um, it'd be nice to have a TIG. We had a, a TIG mentor 2016, but we don't have that capability anymore. Uh, I'll say that for us, I think um, we, we bought into CNC milling at, at one point during our team's growth. And I think the choice that we made at that time, it was a little bit too early and a little bit too much when we first did that. And I think if the key thing to make understand when you move into that CNC space is, do you have the CAD team that can support that? Um, how much experience do does any other mentor on your team have with CNC? Um, and then also, are you buying the the right thing? Now, I think we we bought ours. I think in a time when like hobbyist mills are much better th now than they were back in like I want to say like 2010, 2011. Um, and, uh, I would say that we probably initially bought the wrong machine. Um, and, uh, when you do go into that CNC land, like pay attention to like, is this a vendor that you can have a relationship with? Is this a vendor that is going to help support you and help teach you how to use that machine? Um, and also we initially bought a mill that like had motors that where they couldn't really communicate back to themselves that they had not done the right amount of steps and things like it was not great. And since then we've re, uh, we retrofitted with Accurite. That's been really nice for the particular mill that we had. Um, uh, so just, just think about when you go into that CNC space, do you understand that you have CAD teams that can support that? 
And then also, um, do you have a vendor who will help support you? And do you have the right mentors who can also help support that? Um, because if you have any of those things missing, you can easily buy a really expensive machine that you're not really sure how to use. Um, I'm happy to say that today that's not the case for us, but 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 it, it can easily be that way when you're first moving into that. So just pay attention to the fact that it's much more important that you get really good with your other machines before you move into the CNC and you need to be ready to do that with your team and your mentors and your community. Okay, let's move on to the next question. I think that was a lot of good advice again. I guess I'm going to say that for every question, but <laughs> um, yes, definitely some good things to consider what not to buy as well as what to buy. They're pretty much equally important uh, when you're balancing what works for your shop and also looking at specs and seeing what doesn't fit for your needs is also important. So don't just go rush out and buy a shiny new thing just because it's brand new. Make sure it definitely has a place in your shop and has a place in your budget, but we'll also work with your team for what you need it for. Okay, so with that being said, our next question is, well, you can't build a robot without inventory. You definitely need to have all your materials on hand. So with that, what inventory do you strive to consistently have available to your team? Uh, I'm actually curious of uh, what Mike has to say, because I think we all know 1622 goes to the most amount of like competition. I think like more than all of us combined, right? Like six events in 2019. So they must have like a very robust inventory system or so, like something that they do that like allows them to do that. So uh, I'm very curious of what y'all do. So we build basically all of the frame of a robot out of like two by one aluminum. And then we use a lot of plastic, polycarb, acrylic for a lot of the other pieces like gears or, yeah, mainly gears, panels, stuff like that. Um, I'd recommend to have a lot of churro pieces or hex shafts for axles. Um, other than that, I can't really think of a ton of, um, unless I'm totally blanking on something, ton of other stuff. Uh, we use a lot of wood and cardboard for prototyping. Uh, I like to prototype a lot so that I make sure stuff works. Other than that, I can't really think of anything else. Yeah, I think that's a good point. We, we have like, actually you can see it in the picture behind me, like right there, we have this giant rack that spans the entire length of our shop. I'm not in the shop right now, obviously, but uh, that just has like large pieces of aluminum that we can just pull out. Um, so always like during the off season, we just get a bunch of aluminum. So like, you know, what uh, Micah said, we always have, you know, the sizes that we uh, know we work are going to need on hand. But besides that, I don't think we do anything special. We just have like a, a bunch of bins and we just try to label them and try to put things back, although that doesn't work. I hope someone here has something magical so we can steal it. <laughs> so this is more of a practice that we do on uh, the super nerds, but basically this is more for teams that are like three years old or more, but uh, it's always a really good idea to buy stock before the season. And I'm not just saying that to have a big stock of stuff, but during build season stuff goes out of stock first. And a lot of the time you'll have to pay a premium for shipping because you'll need it on your robot that's competing the next day. So <laughs> uh, it's a really good idea to always buy a bunch of, um, you know, square tubing, just, you know, stock stuff like that, as well as metal sheets. If you run a uh, water jet CNC, anything like that, as well as just, you know, metal pieces if you have a lathe or a mill. Uh, another thing too um, is tool inventory, which isn't described a lot, but uh, it's a really good idea to always keep your toolboxes really neat and nice so people who don't know a whole lot about tools can always have access to them and, you know, have stuff labeled very clearly and label your drawers. That's a big one especially when it comes to cleanup. And that's a really way to keep your shop clean because when it really comes down to it, typically you have about six weeks to build your robot and you can't be wasting time looking for tools. So that's a big one. So keep your tool boxes organized. <laughs> Brian, you can take it from here. Oh, sure. I'll, uh, I guess I'll, I'll jump in and uh, add to that, that I think a, uh, a, uh, ball bearings are something we will buy a lot of ahead of season, especially the, uh, the kind that take hex shaft. 
Um, there are, those seem to go out of stock very regularly during season. And it's nothing is more frustrating than knowing that you could totally have your shafts and your, you know, all your square tubing in place, but you can't run that thing. Cause you don't have any ball bearings for it, or you're going to have to change. You're going to have to do some extra work because you can't get hex shafts, ball bearings, and you're going to have to like go with some other shafting. And yeah. So so, I mean, as your team starts to develop what they like to build or how they like to build, if you can, before you get to season, know that like, hey, we're going to build this robot and it's probably going to have this many different axles just from what we know about our team. Well, how many different ball bearings do you need to have? And the answer is actually usually a lot, a lot more than you might think. Um, and you don't really want to reuse them from season to season because ball bearings wear out, they go bad. And the more you're using from an old robot, the more you're more likely to end up in a competition situation being really unhappy. Um, and so we, we try to avoid that when we can. So we definitely, I think ball bearings are one of the things we always stock up on right before we hit the season. Um, aluminum square tubing, of course, as well. I love the comment about labeling things. That's huge. Like you, you want your, your students and your mentors to understand where everything goes. And if, if you want things to go back where they belong, you need to let people know where they're supposed to be. Um, the other thing, it's not really exactly quite on par with, with this, but I think I'd like to add that, you know, your shop is your shop. Um, and I think that, um, developing traditions with your shop, whether that's just standard protocols or even just like morale building kind of things that you do that's cool, that's kind of unique. Um, those putting effort into developing those traditions makes a big difference about, you know, is this just a shop or is this an FRC shop? Just to bounce off of what Ryan just said, when it comes to making your shop yours in the super nerd shop, we have this uh, wall in our machine shop called uh, the wall of shame. So we put all of our mechanisms that broke during competition mechanisms that were just so crazy. They didn't even get used stuff like that. So <laughs> we have at least one part from every robot dating back to, you know, when we started. So it's really fun to do stuff like that. And got to say having a part on the wall of shame is an honor. <laughs> We have a wall of shame too. So do we. Ours are, more par <laughs> ours are more parts of shame. If someone does something backward or, yeah, but we pin those parts up on the wall. I'll, I'll add to that. We, we have that too. And I'm always a little back and forth on that. I think, uh, I think the important thing is if you do that, you need to make sure your leaders have parts on there because if you're a new student coming to that space and you see the wall of shame, you might not understand the pride that goes into being on that wall or that it's an acknowledgement that we all make mistakes. And so it's really important your leaders understand that that's what that's for. And when it starts to become that, then it becomes like an honor to have something on there. And people are proud to have something on there. Um, but it can be hard to explain it initially, I'll admit, to like people coming into seeing your shop or seeing your program and you're like, a wall of shame? Are you shaming <laughs> students? So you, so you do it, you got to do it right. <laughs> and your leaders can do it right. There might even be mentor parts on our wall. <laughs> well, to err is human. Um, I would like to throw one other inventory thing into the ring from, I guess, another student point of view here in terms of what I always value in prototyping is a ready stock of compliant wheels in all sizes and durometers. Um, those typically, I don't know, for at least our team, they come in all the time in prototyping. And so I think having uh, even if they're worn out from past robots, having a bunch of compliant wheels and really all types of wheels in general, even if they're for your drive bases and just getting stuff slammed on, making sure you have inventory if it's something your budget can support because they can get pricey at some points. Um, compliant wheels typically are very helpful with prototyping. Saigon, so, you want to take it? Oh, yeah. Sorry, I have one last thing. Um, so kind of reminded by uh, like people talking about inventory, I think one big thing that people I think California, we don't have to worry about it. But like everywhere else, people have to worry about buying pool noodles during the summer, uh, because it gets like cost prohibitive if you're not in California. Right. Um, thankfully for us, like in the middle of December, it's still 72 degrees outside. So we can go to like the pool, pool supply shop and get some. But um, it's always best to get some during the summer just in case. Great. So let's move on. Well, um, speaking of prototyping kind of in some of our questions here, um, what are your favorite tools for prototyping? So this is more from less than materials, but now more tools. What do you typically like to use? Um, Micah, do you want to start us off here with the student perspective? Because you did mention some prototyping stuff um, earlier. 
Yeah, so I'll say for our team, the by far the thing we use the most is the laser cutter. Um, we most basically just plywood and cardboard, but if we need like a temporary part, we'll use plywood because it can work for a little while. Or cardboard, if we just want to test the fitment of something, that's what we would usually use. Tyson, then Rick. Yeah, I just want to throw in shaft collars. Those are, I mean, I, I, I try not to put them on a robot, but uh, try to, there's ways to not put them on a robot. But for prototyping, uh, there's nothing faster than, than constraining it with the uh, with a hex, ash, hex shaft, hex bearing, as mentioned before, and a, and a shaft collar. We're probably even more hacky than your team. We use electrical tape wrapped next to the bearing quickly. Let's see what quick the shaft collar. But we do, because we're part of a school, we do have the laser. Um, so we we do cut uh, thin plywood on that. Well, I haven't tried cardboard. That's interesting you said that. We should try doing that. Sometimes some acrylic. If you really want to make good parts, the laser can cut Delrin too. But Delrin's kind of pricey. But we do cut a lot of uh, uh, acrylic and um, I guess it's actually masonite or hardboard for a lot of prototyping. Yeah, cardboard is actually a, a pretty good one to, to laser uh, and it helps kind of give shapes and, and feel of size. This is a weird one. It's not necessarily a tool, but if you have old robots from previous years laying around, a lot of the time, like if you had a 2012 robot, that could shoot the balls from the 2020 season. So it's really good to you know, prototype with your old robots, or at least if you have an old drive base, it's great to just have a drive base and put your prototypes on it. Um, I got to say in 2020, <laughs> we used a lot of our old, uh, old parts to make new things out of them. And we had a, a pretty, pretty advanced little, little prototype bot. So that was, that was nice. Uh, kind of going back uh, off of what Eli just said. So uh, old robots are also super useful to map prototypes onto you, right? But on top of that, um, dollies are also super good to like mount an intake too, right? Because I think something that people forget, right, is the most important part about like an, like an intake or something that interacts with game pieces is how that interacts with the floor in the moving robot. So like having a dolly you can mount a prototype too is always super useful. Uh, also, don't throw motors onto things if you don't need to or you know, at a certain point you need to, but like throw a drill onto there if you can instead, which is much faster. Uh, and also finally... Um, uh, team 5254 has something called Hype Blocks online that you can look up, look up Hype Blocks FRC. It's just a bunch of different like 3D printable blocks that you can just uh, clamp onto two by one metal tubing. And you can throw motors on there and do whatever you want and you can configure it different ways. And it's super easy and super simple. Just print a bunch of those before the season and you can just use them. Uh, and I'll just add that uh, um, we, we actually use weights a lot. Like when we just need to suddenly like realize, oh, we just kind of want to see how it works. And we want to also see how it would work if it was a heavier robot than it is right now because we haven't built the rest of it. Um, so honestly, just having some like dumbbells and weights, dive weights and things like that on hand to strap onto your robot can often uh, be the difference between a much more realistic test and a totally misleading test. Yeah, I'm glad Psycheron brought up uh, spinning stuff without motors or doing a different way. So on uh, the super nerds, we took a, an old drill and then, you know, it has a trigger already. So you can actually power, we put Anderson's on there and we can power a motor by doing that without having a whole setup. And I think the dolphins have one too, but that is super nice. And another thing too, is we have a little um, electronics board that has uh, dials too. So you can test I know I just said don't test motors and I'm saying test motors, but you can just having that variable power and having a control like that without actually hooking it up to a robo Rio and all that stuff. It's really nice to be able to do that. So that is that I would definitely recommend having something like that. Rick, did you want to add something? Yeah. Funny thing about if you didn't hear um, Eli, put Anderson connectors on a, on an old drill. Um, he said, he knows we have one. That's because uh, I was talking to their lead mentor. I think at Battle of the border. I said, what can I do to help you guys? Cause everyone was breaking down then because you can't, unless you had a drill with Anderson connection on there. And I said, here, <laughs> we have one. So they do come in handy. Of course you can, for prototyping, we put a lot of drills with a half inch socket on the end, right on the end of the hex shaft. And you guys all do that. And you spin up your mechanisms to, to prototype. And just to mention too, that was a lifesaver and I <laughs> wish we brought ours. So I'm glad, uh, glad you guys had one as well. <laughs> 
He probably copied one of you guys, as far as I know. I guess it's time for everyone to add a uh, drill with Anderson connectors to their pit packing list. But uh, we just have a couple more questions. So pretty much two more, and then we'll go ahead and end for the night. Um, so we'll go a little faster through these. But um, similar to what are your favorite tools for prototyping, what tool do you use the most when making or working on your robot? We probably have heard some of them already, but just reiterating them um, kind of in one place here. Go ahead and start, Rick. This is not maybe the most used tool, although we use it much more than people think. I even got questioned why I was purchasing it. Um, the Kyle scene, we use a sheet metal brake quite often. So you can build very lightweight parts in conjunction with your CNC router, um, use bends to give it strength and you get rid of a lot of L brackets that way. Um, probably the next tool I have on a, a budget. I, I wanna get a sheet metal shear for prototyping um, because it's kind of weird, not like the old days. Everything that goes through our brake is going through a little CNC router bit, bit, which is crazy, you know? So we can cut bigger parts. So I just need to get a, uh, uh, a stomp shear, I guess, a sheet metal stomp shear, which I know Super Nerds has, and probably, uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, Warlords has that also. Um, this is a small one. So if your team works with chain, make sure you get a, a, a chain breaker from like any mark or one of those other companies. Like it's called like a Dark Souls chain breaker. Uh, and don't use master links, right? Master links are like uh, one of the biggest point of failures for most teams who use chain. Uh, you can just like with one of these chain breakers, right? You can just like disassemble the chain and then uh, reassemble it with the pins and like the regular side plates. Uh, this will like, you know, help improve, um, you know, your, your robustness of your chain systems. And it's like 35 bucks. So like everyone should have one of these. Tyson, did you want to add something? No, I mean, just to answer the uh, question is our team definitely uses our VLOX 50-50. Uh, uh, I mean, we only got it like two years ago when I actually, actually when I first joined and I'd say we probably use it more than we rely on it more now than our um, our Tormach CNC uh, mill. Micah, did you want to add anything from the student perspective as someone who's worked on robots in the trenches recently? Um, no, not really. Um, I think going back way back, I think um, a chain breaker is another really good thing to add to a new team with the five hundred dollar budget. That's another thing you should consider getting. But as for this question, I don't really have anything to add. Okay, and then for our, our last question, this is more of a subjective one, but um, again, getting, you know, kind of a laundry list of tools here. What are your top five favorite tools or machines overall? I guess maybe with uh, FRC focus rather than anything crazy beyond there, like the HP $100,000 electronics 3D printer, but... <laughs> um, yeah, if anyone wants to start. And it can totally be uh, tools that we've already discussed, just getting them all in one big laundry list again. Eli, you can go ahead. Yeah, so I would definitely, I know I talked about earlier, but that uh, Milwaukee, Milwaukee Riveter. <laughs> Riveter. <laughs> and uh, another thing is the, I know this is a custom tool, but the, the little motor uh, tester that I was just talking about, Another one that's really, really cool, in my opinion, is uh, a Dremel, which I, I Tyson mentioned earlier. And uh, another one that I would really recommend is getting a really good vise. Um, it's really important to make sure your, your stuff's not moving on you. And then the very last one, I just want to make sure we mention this is uh, really good PPE equipment because uh, you don't want people getting hurt. Uh, Rick, do you want to go next? Sure. I'm just bouncing. I'm just bouncing off you guys. Um, the Dremel's great for cutoff things. It's probably I've been doing this a while. It's the most abused tool, though. People think they can do anything with it, and they end up just gouging all kinds of stuff with it. So you got to watch out for that. But it's great for what for what it is. And what was oh, and then just the second, the Milwaukee Riveter is. You know, that's our most luxurious tool, I'd say, or the most satisfying tool to use. I, you really don't need it. You really, we got away for years with pneum, pneumatic riveters and, and air, you know, compressed air. I don't think it actually Milwaukee works that much better in the field, maybe on, in a competition. But, uh, but it, it's such a nice tool that uh, I bragged all my friends about it.
Uh, I'll just jump in then too with a, um, some other things that I think are, are pretty useful that we see a lot of use. Um, uh, definitely a press of some kind. Um, we, we've, you know, you don't need to have, to have something crazy huge. It's nice if you do, but, um, but, uh, having a press to like press fit on some things or press fit off some things, uh, can be, uh, really useful. Um, and, uh, it's, uh, we've definitely, that was one of the things we used to have to often like go visit another team be like, Hey, can we borrow your press for like just this one thing? <laughs> um, and, uh, the other thing would be, I would say, uh, calipers it turns out that, uh, measuring, uh, is really important to what you do usually. Um, and so, um, you don't need to have the best calipers, but you do need some calipers. Uh, so you, especially if you're getting into that CNC space, uh, make sure you have a way to measure your stuff. Um, I just think it was mentioned in passing earlier, but the one inch belt sander I've gotten so much use out of in the past. Um, there's so much forming that you can do cut, just shortening stuff, stuff off. I've used it in a lot of ways I shouldn't have. Um, but, uh, it's just, a, it's just amazingly powerful for what it, for what it does, um, for, for what it looks like. It's just a one inch band of, of sandpaper. Um, and then I want to, uh, throw out there that the, what we have, a we 3309's got a um a, a jet cold saw and coming from uh 968 where we where we used either the band saw or the um uh or a, a, cold, a chop saw man it's it's such a difference i know i know i mentioned this in the uh that chief delphi thread but uh but yeah I and mean, it's the, ba- the other than safety which is huge the it's just quiet it's just so quiet. It's it, I, I love it as a, as a shop tool to cut things and it's, it's more precise than any other cutting device I've used before, but, uh, but yeah, it's quiet. <laughs> uh, for me, I think my top five is a, a fridge and a fan. Uh, those are top two, like, unless it's, it's unlivable, uh, a bunch of plastic bags, right. Just to throw stuff into, cause like, you know, you, you need that when you have like random parts lying around flush cutters and a multimeter. Yeah, we used to not throw away all our uh, McMaster uh, baggies. Yeah, stay, store those in a box and you'll end up, you know, organizing all your parts at the end of the year or during your manufacturing process that way. I have a quick question about the cold saw. Um, we bought an aluminum cold saw. I've worked with steel cold saws before that turn low RPM. Is your, is your aluminum a higher RPM one? Um, it does get very precise, but it is kind of scary. Oh, I, I think it goes pretty slow. So I think it's, met, I think the blade is probably okay. a, uh, um, nothing. I mean, I, I don't think it speeds any different. I don't think that we can even change the speed. So I think the blade is probably updated to, to for the aluminum cuts. And you can cut slower RPM with aluminum without an issue. Yeah. Yeah. No, it okay. seems great. I mean, it's, and it's cold to the touch. Like I can yeah. pick it up and hand it over. Whereas you need know, something on the bandsaw and it's just, you got to let it sit for a while. Yeah, we bought a fast cold saw for a fifth because it said aluminum, you need fast. Like, I don't know, I got it. I'm not happy with it. It does cut nice, but it, man, it, it cranks the RPMs. It's, the part is cold, it puts big chips out, but uh, it, it huh. seems kind of dangerous for regular, uh, you know, Maybe students to use. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll show you next time. Yeah. Okay. And then, Micah, do you want to share your, your students' top five tools? Yeah. So I know, that, like, these are more bigger tools, but I get a lot of use out of the mill. And I know Tyson mentioned a belt sander. We have a disc sander, which I've also gotten a lot of use out of. I'm not sure if a belt sander would be better, but we get a lot of use out of a disc sander. Um, 3D printer is really useful for making parts. And I also get a lot of use out of a bandsaw. We cut most of our metal with bandsaws. We don't have a cold saw, but our bandsaw works pretty well. So not sure if that was five, but those are probably my top picks for our shop. Uh, I'll add in that we, uh, one of the more, more unique tools I think we have in, in our shop is we have a, a fest tool. Um, and uh, it's just really nice in terms of uh, coming back to the safety aspect, like any of the tools that you're using, you're, you know, hopefully you're working with students and you're getting them involved and getting them going on everything. And thinking about how safe is the tool that you're teaching them on is a huge thing. And so for us, like uh, moving away from a table saw, which we felt was too dangerous, but like a fest tool basically is a reversed table saw and is very safe in comparison. 
Um, we really like that for doing some of the much larger raw cuts that we have to do. Um, that being said, we, we also use a horizontal uh, bandsaw quite a bit. Um, I'll, uh, I'll acknowledge too that uh, it's less of a tool, but I think um, it's an important feature to consider for your shop is the, the protocol of how a part gets made in your shop. Um, we have a build wall where, and project boxes where like, you know, it comes in from the CAD, it goes into the box, it know, the machinists know they have to make it. When the machinists make it, they put it in and say, now someone has to check it off. And then from there, it goes off to whatever else it might need to. And if it needs to get to anodization or anything like that, there's a whole process for basically that picture moving across the wall. And then in any given day, students and leaders can come in and say, okay, this is what needs to get done today. And I can tell by the wall. Um, and that's been a really useful tool. Project boxes too, just having lots of plastic bins that we can put everything in and, and less, less having less of that. Where is that piece? Where did it go? We spent hours making it and it's gone. Um, it's really nice to eliminate that as much as possible. So uh, think about your protocols as you set up your shop and how you want to keep it organized uh, because that cleanliness is, is your gateway to your safety as well. Um, it's really important to get your uh, folks to understand that a clean shop is a safe shop. Okay, and with that, that is the end of our Shop Essentials panel. Thank you to all of our wonderful panelists for sharing some great information with everybody today. Uh, really appreciate it.